comic books and graphic novels, more than just men in tights, a video documentary created by Colleen Huck for ETEC 540, The Changing Spaces of Reading and Writing. A picture's worth a thousand words, a common saying most people are familiar with, but why does a picture resonate with us, and how are pictures used to tell a story? This video documentary explores the world of comic books and graphic novels, two forms of visual communication that embody the saying, a picture's worth a thousand words. This video documentary will explore the origins and evolution of comic books and graphic novels. When were comic books first created? How have they changed over time? What impact have they had on language? And what role do they play in education? Let's start at the beginning with the origins of comic books. Long before comic books, images were used as a method of communication. Kahn states that cave paintings are the earliest documented form of visual communication, dated as far back as 40,000 BC. Since then, images have been captured on a variety of mediums, from pottery to marble and paper to canvas. Smoldering explains that over time, narratives began being told using sequential pictures. Instead of having one image, multiple images placed in order were used to tell a story. Looking at any one image in isolation would not convey the intended message. Some of the earliest examples include Greek friezes, Trajan's column, and the Bayou Tapestry. This method continued to adapt to include both sequential images and words to tell a story, like illustrated manuscripts. Separate images with limited text telling a story. Sound familiar? This is the premise behind comic books. According to McLeod, most scholars recognize the adventures of Mr. Olbe Olbuck by Rodolphe Toffer in 1837 as the first comic book. However, comic books were not popularized for almost another hundred years. Karzuski explains that during the late 1880s, satirical illustrations began being published in magazines. These illustrations were hand-drawn caricatures or cartoons. Recognizing the popularity, the newspaper industry then began publishing comics to help boost sales. These illustrations were called comics because they were humorous in nature. As comics became more popular, they were collected in anthologies and sold separately from newspapers. These were called comic books. While there are now many non-comedic genres of comics, the name comic book has remained. Before we examine the evolution of comic books, let's take a minute to discuss language in comic books. Comic books and graphic novels have pushed the boundaries of what is considered language in writing. Kahn states that comics are written in visual languages the same way that novels and magazines are written in English. According to Kahn, visual language is using graphic representations structured in a sequence to convey a message. And just like spoken language, this varies by culture. Comic books employ their own unique visual language, one that is rich with both sights and sounds. Haig states that you can listen to a comic book with your eyes. Sounds are represented visually in comics through graphics or language. Most comic books and graphic novels use both captions and speech bubbles. Smoldron explains that captions are often used for narration, setting the stage for the scene and providing information on location or time. Comparably, speech bubbles are used to capture conversations and the tail is pointed towards the head of the person speaking. Smoldron also explains that thought bubbles, which are cloud-shaped with circles leading towards the person's head, represent internal thoughts and monologues. The shape and color of speech bubbles is another unique feature of comic books' visual language. For instance, bubbles with jagged outlines and bold text are called scream bubbles, and they indicate a loud sound or screaming character. Whisper bubbles indicate a softer hush tone by using dotted outlines and small gray font. Color bubbles are often used to represent emotions, like red for anger or green for envy. Simply by manipulating the shape, size, and color of graphics, the visual language of comics can change. Let's now explore other ways comics have evolved over time, from the first comic book to the modern age of comics. Stein et al. share that most historians agree the famous Bunnies, a carnival of comics published in 1933, 
is the first American comic book. It was 36 pages and consisted of original comic strip style material. The Famous Funnies was a precursor to the first era of comic books in America, the Golden Age. According to Stein et al., the Golden Age was from 1938 to 1950. It began in 1938 with Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster's Superman. Superman was the beginning of the superhero subgenre that popularized comic books. Batman and Robin, Wonder Woman, Captain America, Flash, and Aquaman were all created during the Golden Age. Orsusi believes that comic books have always represented the issues of their time. During the Golden Age, the superhero character protected innocence and fought against evil. Some comics, like Captain America, even depicted battles against evil Nazi regimes. Comic books distilled complex political issues in an enjoyable format children could understand. The Golden Age came to a halt in the 1950s when psychiatrist Friedrich Wertham released his book, Seduction of the Innocent. Stein et al. explained that Wortham believed that the violence depicted in comic books would have a bad effect on children and might lead them to committing crimes. Parents began to boycott comic book stores and burn their children's comic books. This promoted the American Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency to investigate comic books and create a code that required all books to go through an approval process. After Wortham's book, the comic book industry reinvented itself bringing in the Silver Age of comic books from 1956 to 1970. Karthuski explains that authors like Stan Lee created new superheroes readers could identify with, like Fantastic Four, Hulk, and the Spider-Man. He showed that comics were not about violence like Wortham feared, but about flawed, relatable characters who ultimately tried to do the right thing. These characters both entertained and taught valuable moral lessons. Much like the Golden Age, Silver Age comics also reflected social issues. The X-Men series came out in 1962, a group of mutant superheroes who decided to protect all of humanity despite being discriminated against by the rest of society. Korsuski argues this parallels the discrimination against minorities experienced during that time. The next era in comic books is the Bronze Age, the dates of which are less defined but roughly from 1970 to 1985. During this time, well-established characters started to experience more personal hardships. Stein et al. mentioned the death of Spider-Man's girlfriend and Iron Man's struggle with alcoholism, two very real and relevant issues people face. While comic books continued to thrive in the Bronze Age, the comic book industry wanted to reach a new readership. Thus began the new model of comic book, the graphic novel. Brian Fisher explained that there are two types of graphic novels. The first, which accounts for about 90%, is a paperback collection of stories initially published as comics. The second type is a standalone story presented in comic form but published as a book. Many people, like Korsuski, believe the term graphic novel was just a market employ to make comics more credible. Stein et al. emphasize that there is a negative stigma attached to comic books and many academics and readers alike do not consider them to be a serious literary form. The term graphic novel was first coined in 1964 by Richard Kyle. The first graphic novel, called The Contract with God by Will Eisner, was released in 1978. During that time, graphic novels started gaining some attention, and Marvel released a graphic novel line. But according to Stein et al., it wasn't until 1986, when Art Spiegelman's Mouse was released, that graphic novels went mainstream. Now, there are graphic novels for all age groups. Two features that set graphic novels apart from comic books are genre and audience. Despite comic books being known for the superhero subgenre, Korskuski points out that there are a variety of genres, including westerns, romance, fantasy, and crime. Graphic novels, on the other hand, are not known for or defined by the superhero subgenre. Stein et al. explain that graphic novels' claim to fame was through stories of internal struggles and historical pieces. While superheroes are still represented in graphic novels, they have been adapted and often showcase a darker side to superheroes. Think of graphic novels like Dark Knight and Watchmen. The tone is much more serious than traditional comic books. Graphic novels reach a larger audience than comic books. Stein et al. explain that there are graphic novels tailored to youth and teens mostly focused on fantasy and youth fiction. There are also graphic novels targeted at adults on crime, horror, and non-fiction. Bray and Fisher state that there are entire graphic novel sections in most public libraries, 
and graphic novels are starting to be used in education. Let's now discuss graphic novels in education. Fry and Fisher state that graphic novels are a great way to entice reluctant readers. The visual language is often more appealing and can help cross language and cultural barriers. Seema and Warner believe that the stigma attached to comic books is also present for graphic novels. People have a hard time believing that a book made up predominantly of pictures can be as informative and academically sound as a novel or textbook. Fray and Fisher argue that graphic novels can help explain complex topics in a way that is easy to understand. There are many non-fiction graphic novels that can be used to supplement curriculums. Graphic novels and comic books can also be used to illustrate many topics explored in post-secondary education, like feminism, linguistics, psychology, history, and dystopic literature. Sima and Weiner said, Comic books and graphic novels are beginning to take their rightful seat at the table of quality literature of our time. The onus is now on educators to consider new mediums for instruction and utilize the wealth of knowledge graphic novels can provide.